Welcome back to Jacques in the Garden. It is the final week of February and the garden is starting to look quite full and very green and lush. Now there are a couple problems. You might be seeing a couple of them there and a whole lot of them back here behind me. These are all my broccoli plants which have started to flower. This is a totally natural, normal part of their life cycle, but now we need to deal with them. I'll tell you all about it and I'll also show you exactly how I turn over raised beds like this one over here to get them ready for the next planting which I'm very excited for because it's finally almost spring. If anyone gets any honey that happens to taste like broccoli, let me know because my broccoli plants have been absolutely covered in bees. It's hard to get so many nice open flowers as a bee this time of year, so I'm sure they've found this to be quite the buffet for them. Now, the way this works is that essentially as the plant gets old, it's going to just start to produce flowers. We're actually eating what are essentially unopened flowers. That's what the broccoli florette is. So as you leave it for too long, it'll start loosening up just like these are here and eventually open up into flowers. So that's what's going on here. It's a totally normal part of the life cycle. And as you could see, this plant has been through quite a lot. There's a whole bunch of branching in here. I've harvested from it many times already. Now, one of the things that's sort of true here is that once you start getting so much flowering, this will start to taste worse. Just objectively, it's not going to taste as good. Now, once they're this open, I'd say that at this point, it's going to be a little bit woody in the stem there. It's not gonna be as pleasant to eat, but it is definitely still edible. The other thing I wanted to mention is that all of these leaves here, especially the nice young tender leaves like this one here, are going to actually taste quite good. We cooked up a lot of these and threw them in our lasagna the other night as a sort of green to boost our lasagna, and it was delicious. So I'll probably be saving some amount of these leaves at the very least, but anything that's open like this, just forget about it. It's going to have a very woody stem. It's not gonna taste good. Even on the burgundy broccoli, it's not even really staying purple anymore. It's starting to lose that color and just be green. So I know for a fact that these plants are fully spent. We might find a couple usable florets on the broccolini over here, but let's get into it. I have to get a lopper because you're gonna have a real hard time cutting this with hand pruners, I'll tell you that much. All right, before we deal with this, I wanted to do a quick little talk about leaving the roots in the ground. Now, what I'm going to do here is take my loppers, get as close to the base of this actual plant and cut it at that point. The reason why I'm doing this is that it's one of the principles of no dig. And while I wouldn't say that I'm a full out no dig person, I do like to follow many of the principles because I think they actually make a lot of sense for building great soil. By leaving this nub down here with all the root mass in the soil, we're doing a couple different things. We're providing pathways for water to flow down along all the roots that are now broken up into the soil. And also those roots will eventually decay and become organic matter that actually increases the fertility of your soil. So there's a lot of different good reasons to do things like this, even if you don't fully practice every single part of no dig. Now, the one thing I will say about brassicas, so things like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbages, is that if you don't cut it low enough, they will regrow. You have to really go down to the soil level and cut them there, which is why I mentioned that before I chopped that guy. So some of these plants are gonna go straight to the chickens as snacks for them. The rest are gonna get chopped up and thrown in our compost. So I'm gonna go down the line here, cut the rest out of this bed, and then we'll move on to the next one. All right, so here's the base of the stem and you wanna get right down to where that root ball is coming out of. If I cut it here, you could see even right there is a point where it could regrow from. So come down very low, just like that, and give it a cut. This stump now at this height shouldn't actually really be able to regrow. It should be totally fine. So now we have the majority of those big plants out of the way. Let's deal with some of these. So let's go ahead and clear this bed as well because the way that I prep beds in ground versus raised beds is a little bit different. So I'll give you guys that direct comparison. Same idea here. We're gonna come to the base and give it a lop. Actually right here, let me show you guys. This plant has already started to regrow and this is very compelling for a certain reason. So here's exactly what I was talking about. The plant will regrow from the base. In fact, it has many, many little side shoots here, including one that's even producing a little baby florette. So you have a couple options here. I could come at the base here, cut it lower. I could dig this root out, or I could leave it, and this will just turn into another broccoli plant for me. I would do that if I didn't already have plants for this bed. And of course, like this one over here doesn't have that. So why would I just leave one random broccoli plant in the middle here? So what I'm going to do is go ahead and lop it right there. So I get all of these new growths out of the way. So by the way, you guys have been asking me about saving seed. Now this is a hybrid broccolini, so I wouldn't bother saving seed from it. A hybrid plant is one that doesn't have stable genetics, but here's what you're going to be seeing. At the top here, 
is the flower from the broccoli. That's a good sign. That's where the seed will start. And all these little things right there, these are all tiny little seed pods. So eventually these will swell up and get bigger. They'll dry down and they'll be full of seed. That is the seed that you could save to keep growing your heirloom broccoli if that is one that you have in your garden. The final plant at the end of the bed here actually looks pretty good. It is obviously still flowering, but much less so than all the others. So what I'm going to do is run a little experiment for you guys. I'm going to trim off any florets, any flowering points, fully bring the bush down of this broccoli to a lower point, and we'll see if we could get it to still produce edible delicious broccolini. And this time of year, we'll know pretty quick if this works. So I'm gonna get trimming and I'll show you guys what it looks like at the end. So these are the only florets I actually was able to save. All of these are the ones that I deemed as unedible. And what I did here is I went through the plant and I looked at the stem. Everywhere where the stem hit a point where a leaf comes out is another potential site for broccoli to emerge. So right there is a baby broccoli plant. So what I did is I chopped until I saw that fresh new growth there. And that will now be the next broccoli that I harvest is this little guy that's not yet emerged. So that's the general idea there. We're just pruning it down to remove any flowering. And now we're going to see if this will produce delicious edible broccoli once again. Now that that task is done, we have them all out of this bed over here and a huge pile. Can't give all that to the chickens. That's too much broccoli. But what we need to do now is come through here reset and refresh this bed for the next planting. Before we go through and flip this bed to get it ready for the next planting, and also we have to go get the plants over there, I wanna talk about these last couple plants here. Some of these are just failures. I'm going to call them what they are. They do not look healthy. This guy even has aphids on it. It is a young brassica seedling. Now what I could do is try to gently, huh, that was semi-gently, pull it up so I get most of the roots, and I could transplant it back in here if I choose. So I'm going to go ahead Maybe I'll try a little bit better on this guy here. Get a nice root ball there. And there's one more here. That guy's so small I'm not gonna bother with. And then this one at the very end here. So I saved three of them. I can replant these now. One of the nice things about raised beds is it's really easy to pull out plants like this. What we have in the back here are beans. These beans have failed. They failed because actually they got dug up multiple times by a raccoon or a skunk or a possum. Who knows, they came into my bed tore it up. I'm actually shocked that some of these beans did make it. But what I'm going to do is since the germination is so spotty anyway, is we're going to remove all those and restart. Because I do want beans in here, but the long-term goal for this bed in particular, the reason why I got a four by eight short birdies bed here is because I wanted to grow tomatoes in it. I wanted to grow tomatoes in a nice raised bed soil that I know has never had root, not nematode, which is something that I have been unfortunately dealing with. All right, so the first thing we're going to do here is just rake the surface of the bed. All I'm trying to do is get it relatively level to itself. Not a big deal whatsoever. This is more just for planning and aesthetics alone and nothing else. You'll notice that I have straw mulch on this bed. I'm not worried about it whatsoever. If straw gets buried, it's not going to lock out nutrients in the same way that wood is. So you could totally leave it and it'll grow just fine. Now, if your bed is a little bit short, like for example here, I'm only like settled about an inch at the most. That's totally fine. You don't have to add anything to fill it back up. It will grow just fine with this amount of soil, no problem whatsoever. Now I'm going to be taking a little bit of an extra approach here because I know that this bed hasn't been here for long. It doesn't have that much nutrition in it. It's only really grown one cycle of plants and those plants were very heavy feeders, which is broccoli. So I'm going to be doing two different things. I'm going to be adding fertilizer, which I'll go grab next. And then I'm going to be topping it all off with a nice layer of compost. I'm not going to put any mulch after that because that black dark compost is going to help this entire bed heat up even faster. When you have straw mulch on top, it will reflect a lot of light and that'll cool the soil down, which is great in the summertime. But right now I'm trying to get that head start into spring. I wanna make sure the soil stays nice and warm. So I'm gonna go get some fertilizer and also a wheelbarrow of compost. I just finished getting the compost, but it is now starting to sprinkle. So let's go over to the greenhouse and I'll show you which plants I'm going to be putting in. Hopefully the sprinkle will stop because otherwise uh, my camera is gonna get wrecked. Here we are in the greenhouse. It is, as I mentioned, sprinkling a little bit, nothing too crazy, but here are the plants in question. This has been a very messy season as I start to figure out how to use my greenhouse. Down here I have my propagation station. These are actually beans that I'm regrowing from a bag of dry beans that I got. I have a couple cuttings of figs here that I have started to leaf out and hopefully are rooting. I also have a couple avocado pits that I'm going to be experimenting with on grafting. So more on those 
all later. But for now, let's talk about what I have here. These are the tomatoes I mentioned. These are the ones I started in a video recently where I talked about all the different varieties I'm growing. As you can see, they've only now just begun getting their first true leaves, so they have a ways to go before they go on the ground. But these guys are entirely ready to go. This is the lettuce and spinach that I sowed from my spring uh, sowing video that I did not too long ago. Actually, the 16th of January, it appears. So they've been growing quite nicely. These are definitely ready to get transplanted. In fact, they're a little bit over. You could tell that there's some yellow leaves there, so they're starting to run out of nutrients. But they still are good to go. Now, the other thing I'm going to be planting here is the last of the brassicas that I have. So here I have a cheddar cauliflower. Here I have uh, broccolini. And then over here I have the Dicheco broccoli. So these are gonna go in that bed because I, again, I'm not expecting these to last long. Our spring season here can be a bit of a wild card. You don't know if it's gonna get crazy hot or <laughs> crazy cold. So you just have to kind of plant the whole entire spectrum of plants. So sounds like it's still sprinkling, but might be light enough to risk it. So let's grab this flat right here. We'll head on out and we'll get that bed flipped. As I mentioned, the first thing we're going to do here is apply some fertilizer. This is the Espoma starter one. I like this one because it's inoculated with mycorrhizae and also it is a 433, which means it has more nitrogen than anything else. So now I'm not going to mix this at all whatsoever because I could see that my distribution is good. Oftentimes I ask myself, should I be mixing it after I apply it? But in this case, I know I'm topping it with compost. So there's no need to work it into the soil. Now, if you're not going to be topping with anything, I highly encourage you to actually bury it into the soil a little bit. Otherwise, it's going to look all funky on the surface and it will probably start growing some fungi at the top and it'll just look weird. So make sure you bury it. It's just better for the plants. That way it's actually cycling down into the soil and not blowing away or anything like that. Now the bed has been flipped. It is ready to get planted. So I'm gonna go grab those starts I showed you earlier We'll talk about how I could plant this and still leave space for tomatoes in just about a month. So what do we have here is two different types of lettuce. I have Little Gem and Vivian. This is a tiny one, that's a standard. And then we have some Oceanside spinach. Now, as I mentioned, I am going to be putting tomatoes in here. The way I'm going to be planting them is in a straight line in the front section here, maybe about six inches in from the edge. So this front section, I'm going to leave probably unplanted. I will put the little gem or the spinach in the very front here and then put some behind that row. But let's go ahead and just get planting and you'll see exactly what I mean. So with these guys, they do have a bottom hole, but it is quite small. So what I like to do is just give them a nice firm tap on every single side. That'll loosen up the soil so you could grab your plant just like that, pull it out and get the transplant in. So this one's the little gem. So I'm going to um, actually, let's go ahead and do the spinach up front here first because spinach does not get big and um, honestly probably won't last <laughs> until spring or until the end of spring at the very least because uh, spinach does not seem to like growing here very much for me. So here's a little plug of spinach. I'm gonna go ahead, pop that in just like that. I'm gonna go down the line and fill in this entire area. So you can just grab your plug, pop it out just like that. And like I said, if you smack the sides, it's really quite easy to pull them out, even if you're not pushing from the bottom. Just make sure you're grabbing the actual plant and not the one next to it, which is what I did with one of the spinach there. And that didn't go so well. Now, when it comes to lettuce, by the way, if you do have multiple seeds like I do here, what I'm going to do is thin this out. So these two over here, I could just try to split. So right there, that's another transplant that'll easily survive, no problem. Um, but otherwise, if you don't need that much spinach, just try to thin it to one. It's better to get one good head of lettuce instead of two weird ones stuck together, at least in my opinion. So now that we have the first two rows in, I've decided that in the middle section there, I'm going to put this final planting of cauliflower, at least final for me here in my zone. It's starting to heat up a little bit too much. And I wanted to give you guys a quick little warning here when it comes to transplanting brassicas in your garden. This is not the stage you want them to be at. You want them to be a little bit younger, especially if they're in a smaller volume of soil like these are here, because what happens is that the longer a brassica, things like cauliflowers or broccoli, sit in their soil tray, the more likely it is to actually bolt or go to flower, and then it's not going to be very edible. So my plan here is to simply take these, pop them right in the middle, and the reason I'm putting them in the middle is that this is a two by four foot bed. So a two by four foot bed, is going to be a little bit harder to access in the center 
Whereas the edges are going to be places where you're going to want to harvest things that are continuously ready. Now the cauliflower is done once and that's it. So putting it in the middle makes a lot of sense because now it's not going to be something I have to figure out how to reach over and access. So now I'm going to be adding some of these provider bush beans. These are beans that are not only prolific, but will germinate even in the cooler times of the year. So fantastic for an early spring bean. The recommended spacing here is about four inches. I'm gonna do just that. And we're gonna plant them in pretty densely. Whenever I get close to one of these cauliflowers, I'm going to skip the space around it because cauliflower can be quite the sizable plant when it fully grows in. And I don't wanna really have to compete with that. Okay, just loosely cover all those bean holes with some of this compost that we added. And we should be good to water this in and move on to the next task. It's always a good idea to water plants in after you've transplanted them, especially for things like the lettuce up here, which I literally ripped apart. There's just not that many roots around them. So making sure they have at least that initial drink of water is going to ensure they get off to the best start that they possibly can and put out plenty of new roots to fill up this bed. So I don't have time to fully show you guys how I'm going to flip the in-ground bed, but I will show you the only major difference, and that is using a digging fork or broad fork, if you happen to have one of those, to loosen up the soil. It's more important when it comes to native soil to do this because this is a more clay-rich substance, at least here in my yard it is. And what that means is that it gets compacted through every season of growth. So what I like to do here is just get my digging fork. You could use any digging fork that you get from anywhere. Pop it into the soil, pull it back until that ground fractures. You don't wanna flip it over entirely. You're just trying to break up the soil, break up the roots that were previously grown in there. And if it's hard to push in, then that's a good sign that you definitely are gonna wanna be doing this. So just like that, pull it back until the soil cracks as it is right here and then go ahead and add your fertilizer, your compost and mulch, whatever you wanna to do to that bed. Now, when you do fracture the soil up like this, you might wanna leave it for about a day to settle all those air pockets before planting directly into it. It's just going to give you better results, in my opinion. All right, we're checking on the chickens here and here's an example of a two-day broccoli stem that I threw them the other day, entirely picked down to the stems. Let's see what they did with the one we gave them earlier. Looks like uh, they definitely did some work here, but there is plenty left to do on this guy. Looks like when I threw them that weird cabbage, they actually preferred that quite a bit. And there is nothing left there. So cabbage is their favorite. They'll definitely eat broccoli if I give it to them. Here's another one. This is usually what they do to it. They pick it until it's just a collection of twigs. So I'll leave this here for them to finish tomorrow. But you chickens, you're recycling these broccolis into delicious eggs, and that's why you get a nice pile of little grublies there as a treat for you guys. Since we're on the theme of brassicas, things like cabbages and broccoli, I wanted to show you guys some problems that you're probably going to either run into or maybe you already have. So let's take a closer look at some of these cabbages because I definitely see a problem here. Here are the cabbages, and what I wanted to show you is this over here. You see that there are some holes here, but what's even more indicative of a problem is all of those little pellets there. Let me actually take some of this up here. I don't mind ripping this leaf even though I'm going to lose it. It's already covered in poop. So see all those little, they're almost like squarish. That is the caterpillar poop. So this guy is munching its way through. It's probably inside my cabbage here somewhere. I don't even see it anywhere. So that's also a problem is that they can be quite cryptic to see, especially when they're bright green and the same color of your cabbage. It's a little easier to spot them on the purple ones, but just, oh, by the way, <laughs> Look at the size of this cabbage here. This is going to be the world champion for me at least. But let me show you how I deal with this. It is actually a pesticide, but it's a pesticide that I think is justifiable to use. The pesticide that we are going to be applying today is called Bt bacillus thuringiensis, aka in this case it's called thuricide. Now this is actually a bacteria. It's not a chemical, it's not also a broad spectrum pesticide. This is the only pesticide that I'll ever say that I use, and it's the only one that I actually use. Now, the cool thing, the reason why it is on the exclusive list is the only one I bother with, is that first of all, it's a bacteria, it's not a chemical, so that's great. I know it's not some weird random thing that I'm spraying that just happens to kill things. Second, it is not broad spectrum. It only kills caterpillars, and even better, it only kills caterpillars that eat the things that you sprayed this on. So if I spray those cabbages only, and a cabbage looper, or uh, other, the cabbage, um, I can't even remember the other guy that has a similar name, but anything that eats your cabbages or broccoli, 
it's only gonna kill those. It's not gonna kill all the other wonderful caterpillars around you. I love caterpillars, I love butterflies, which is what caterpillars turn into. So I don't wanna kill everything. I only wanna kill things specifically on that cabbage because if it bores its way all the way to the center, it could rot out the entire head. And honestly, in my opinion, that's worse for the environment, me growing the entire plant to only have to throw it away, than just killing a specific type of caterpillar specifically only on that plant. So that is why this is the only one I would ever recommend. I don't mess around with anything that's broad spectrum, which even includes neem. Neem can kill other things. So like I said, this is the only one I bother with. I also ended up getting a larger pump can here. Uh, by the way, the rate for this is about a tablespoon per gallon, so I'm going to measure out two tablespoons here. The reason why I got this larger pump can instead of the hand one that I had before is I want to start experimenting with different things like foliar sprays. And that is when you spray a plant with a compost tea or a fertilizer directly onto the leaves. And the hope there is that the leaf can actually absorb some of those nutrients, but I have such a big garden that the only way for me to test to see if that even works is to get a bigger pump just like this. So I'm going to go ahead, add some water here, and we'll go around and spray those cabbages. All right, we got this pumped up. Now what we are going to be doing is entirely spraying all of the cabbage leaves. Also on the inside here, the nice thing about something like this is that it is safe to eat afterwards as long as you do it within a certain time frame. I'm not gonna say the number because I don't remember off the top of my head, but this is the cabbage in question that we know we had damage on. So what I'm going to do is also Make sure I spray the holes because I know that that's where there was definitely a caterpillar. And we're just going to go ahead and soak these plants entirely. Hopefully the caterpillar takes a nibble of this BT and that will effectively cancel them out. The reason why I want to protect these cabbages is that it is absolutely massive. I can't even remotely wrap my head around this big thing. So I want to make sure that I actually am able to eat it and save it. It's starting to tie up. It's still got a couple weeks left probably I'm sure. But I also want to show you guys here the wheat. This is the wheat that I planted in a Hugo culture mound. It is filling out quite nicely, very plump. It's going to be a fantastic harvest. We're going to be making bread out of this right here. And now I just have these last couple brassicas to reset, but the rest of the garden here is now looking much, much better. So that's going to be a wrap for this one, guys. We covered quite a bit, including how and when to reset your brassica plants, and also a little experiment here to see if that guy comes back how to plan and plant out a bed with multiple cycles in mind, planning for tomatoes there, and also how to protect your big, hopefully beautiful cabbages, just like these guys over here. So if you have any questions about anything I covered, please drop them down in the comments and I'll be sure to reply.